How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? What's the real truth about Citizen Kane? It'll probably turn out to be a very simple thing. Hello, everybody. We hope you're doing well. I'm Max. <sighs> and this is me, Parker. And welcome back to another episode of Better Than Citizen Kane, the highly subjective show where we look at a movie and ask the question, is it better than Citizen Kane? From now on, we take a movie, old or new, criticized or praised, and look at it through piece, three pieces of criteria. Did it rewrite the stars? How well is it doing what it's trying to do? And how does it connect with us emotionally? Or rather... Does it make us come alive? And if a million dreams about Citizen Kane are keeping you awake at night, that's fine, because we're not here to hate on it. After all, there's a reason it's earned its reputation. But when every movie ever made has walked the tightrope toward the greatest show of all time, you have to wonder, is there something better than Citizen Kane? And because the last 30 episodes were never enough... This week, we're taking a look at a popular, Oscar-nominated film that portrays the rise and fall of a fictionalized interpretation of a famous American businessman as he reflects on the woes of his childhood, meets with a famous European government leader, and deals with a publicized affair that crumbles his rise to fame. No, not Citizen Kane. Today, we're looking at the other side of that coin, The Greatest Showman 2016. That was really good. I'm so tired. Barker, that I'm was so, so good. Barker, Barker, do you see what I did there at the end with the, with the Greatest Showman uh, Citizen Kane mix-up? Max, because... I, saw, I saw everything you did the whole, every step of the way. Oh, were there other things that I put in there? <laughs> Silly me. Happy April Fool's Day, everybody. Uh, I'm Max, and that's Barker, as we just said. Um, and if you missed last week's episode, or <laughs> two weeks ago's episode, um... Today is a funny little prank on Parker, because uh -huh. Parker, Parker, tell us your history with The Greatest Showman, if you don't mind. All right, look, I, <laughs> in my undergrad, I studied theater, and during my time as an undergrad, this movie came out, and everybody I knew was talking about it, and I listened to a little bit of the music, and I saw a few of the clips in the trailers, and I went... This doesn't look like it's for me. I don't think I'll have a very good time with hmm. it because hmm. some people really like the music, but most people around me are like, it's not great. And a lot of general people I knew were like, it's not great. And I said, hmm, probably isn't great. And so hmm. Hmm. I've decided that I was like, oh, you know what? I just not going to not going to bother with it. I'm not going to worry about it. And I never sought it out. And I have been running from it ever since. Until me. <laughs> Until Maxwell Benyon. Until me, because I uh, had seen this in 2017. Uh -huh. um, no, actually, I probably saw it in 2018. I didn't see it when it, right when it came out, because it came out, and I didn't really hear anything about it. Um, and we'll touch on that later. But um, basically, I got invited to go to the movies, and I had a really uh, traumatic experience in which... I tried to hold my pee for the whole movie, and then my legs started hurting really bad, uh, and then I peed for a really long time. So I missed like a good chunk of this movie the first time I saw it, and then months okay. later, it was like the last. It was like a free day in math, I want to say, mm -hmm. and this was shown for some reason, or it was like it was close to the last day of school. You know how like that last week of high school math. each year right. was always just like nothing, and you just wander the halls and yeah. do whatever. I wandered into like my math teacher's class and just the greatest showman was playing. So we just sat in on the greatest showman for a little bit. Sure. Um, I was a choir kid. I was a theater kid. And so, and like Hamilton had kind of died down a little bit. So obviously the greatest showman came at a really great time um, to distract me from my constant listening of Dear Evan Hansen. Sure. So truly you can see the trajectory of, I was listening to Hamilton nonstop. <laughs> That was unintentional. And then... <laughs> this episode's going to kill me. No, it's going to be really good. You're going to feel rejuvenated, and everyone's going to feel rejuvenated. And 
then I listened to <laughs> I listened to Dear Van Hansen all summer, 2017. And then like 2018, I was like, whoa, The Greatest Showman. And I didn't yeah. think it was like I wasn't like won over by this. We were talking about this when we watched it because Parker and I did watch this together. And Parker may or may not have been a little uh, eased into the film. <laughs> Um, I think the word you're looking for is drunk. Yes, <laughs> I wasn't. I didn't want to share that for you, but no, that was the no, whole no. point. We got a bunch of people together, and everyone was drunk except me, yeah. because except I was because I was riding the high of, of revisiting the greatest. He, show. He was driving the ship. He was our DUI driver. He was <laughs> yeah. Our, he I was, was our the, I was the DV. designated driver yeah. of the elephant, if you will. Exactly. Um, and uh, yeah, we just watched this, and I was surprised at the nostalgic connection I have to this. Um, for the reason that it came out my senior year of high school and you just kind of latch on to whatever. Mm-hmm. So that's it was funny because while we were watching it, I was being belligerent as is the bit you're going to get all episode. Um, yes. And Max was on board with it for like 75%. And then once in a while I'd say something's like, well, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> he would suddenly get defensive. Yeah. Of the movie. And I don't know why. Because I really, you know what? I do care. I care a lot because that's the bit for the episode. (laughs) (laughs) And obviously I also cared at least a little. And that's okay. You're allowed to care. You're allowed to have an attachment to this. Because, because Parker, Mm -hmm. I have prepared a four page document detailing the, the history and the production of The Greatest Showman. And it would have been twice as long if only I'd had the time. Uh-huh. Um, but I didn't. So tell me, Parker, do you want to go where it's color- covered in all the colored lights? Where the runaways are running the night? Parker, impossible comes true. It's taking over you. Parker, guess what? This what? is the greatest show. Also known as how the greatest showman came to be. Come with me, Parker and dear listeners, to 2009. Hugh Jackman's mm-hmm. about to host the 81st Academy Awards. It's during rehearsals for the Oscars that producers Lawrence Mark and Bill Condon, director of Dream Girls and the screenwriter on Chicago 2002, compare Jackman to P.T. Barnum, famous circus man, mermaid discoverer, and also piece of shit. Jackman expressed. Once- Hello. Sounds like a mean comparison. Be like, you know who you remind me of? <laughs> Asshole. Parker, 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 Parker. You don't even know how these people perceive P.T. Barnum yet. Oh, oh, I can't wait. Jackman expressed interest in a Barnum project. So, Mark and Condon approached one of the writers for the 81st Academy Awards ceremony, Jenny Bix, to do the hard part. Bix was maybe best known for being executive producer on Sex and the City, but had previously written for television and also the film What a Girl Wants, 2003, starring Amanda Bynes. She and Condon would go on to write the screenplay for The Barnum Project, just before Condon would direct what I assume is his opus, The Twilight Saga Breaking Dawn Parts 1 and 2, and three whole years before Bix would write what I assume is her opus, the Blue Sky animated picture Rio 2. Sure. The Barnum Project was announced in 2009. In early 2010, Jackman headed to Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, to shoot a humorous commercial for Lipton Iced Tea. It he wasn't was very... for Rio Two. No, Rio Two was. He didn't go. Animated. He didn't go. No, he didn't. He didn't go and do the mocap for Rio Two in Rio. No, no. Boo. I think they filmed that in Burbank. Jackman headed to Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, to shoot a humorous commercial for Lipton Iced Tea. He was very excited about this commercial because it was a high-energy, positive script that incorporated many of the dancing and performance skills he had developed as an actor. This humorous commercial opens very humorously with Jackman reading a magazine with his own face on it. Parker, it's so funny. He sets it down and looks, he said, well, just wait. He sets it down and looks exasperated, perhaps even parched. He reaches for a Lipton iced tea and drinks it. Suddenly, he's dancing around a Tokyo hotel with various women. Oh, can you imagine? Anyway, the commercial was directed by Michael Gracie, a fellow Australian, though he grew up in Melbourne while Jackman grew up in Sydney. This didn't stop the crew of the commercial from assuming, though. According to Gracie in a 2017 interview with Matt Fernandez for Variety, Since I'm Australian, they just assumed I knew him, and I didn't correct them. On the first day of rehearsals, Hugh walks in, he sees me, puts his arms out, and shouts, Michael! 
As we're hugging, he whispers in my ear, yeah, mate, they think I know you, so just go along with it. <laughs> I figured I wouldn't do an accent. <laughs> sure. Figured I'd opt instead for really serious kind of intimidating uh, delivery from Jackman. Yeah, I'm loving, I'm loving this NPR expose. <laughs> Thank you. So we pretended like we were best friends the whole shoot, and we had so much fun. When Hugh said, let's make a movie, I wasn't even that excited. And th to this day, he reminds me of that. <laughs> Gracie goes on to say, traditionally what happens is that you never hear from that actor again. In Hugh's case, true to his character, you know, a real Barnum type, he sent sure. me a script for the first draft of The Greatest Showman. Michael Gracie was announced as the director of The Barnum Project in 2011. Ashley Wallen, another Australian and the choreographer for the Lipton Ice Tea commercial shoot in Brazil, would also eventually join The Greatest Showman production as choreographer. This is probably because, as Jackman commented at the time, the execution of the script was a collaborative process between Lipton Ice Tea, the director Michael Gracie, the choreographer, <laughs> choreographer Ashley Wallen, and me. It was a wonderful opportunity for me to have more creative input and involvement. Said Ashley Wallen of the commercial's influences, yes, we're still in the Lipton Ice Tea commercial, we have referenced iconic choreography like Bob Fosse <laughs> alongside comedic influences and used Michael Jackson-influenced moves for other scenes to bring a mixture of different styles together. One can't help but wonder whether it was this mixture of iconic and modern styles that would inspire Michael Gracie as he began to make plans for the Barnum Project. Three years later, just as Jackman's commercial contract with Lipton Ice Tea was coming to a close in 2013, Broadway lyricist duo Benj Pasek and Justin Paul were in L.A., fresh off of writing the lyrics and music to Dogfight, a stage adaptation of the 1991 film, and about to take on lyrics and music for another Broadway project called Dear Evan Hansen. According to Pasek in a 2017 interview with Deadline, they were having a general meeting at Fox with someone, and they said, hey, my colleague down the hall is working on a musical. You're Broadway, guys. You should talk to him if he's in. We went down the hall, and he was like, here's the mood reel. The director is this guy, Michael Gracie. He's a first-time director and a real visionary. Let me see if he's in town right now. This wasn't the first time that Gracie had been praised as a visionary perfect for a music-centric film, however. In 2013, Rocket Picture CEO Steve Hamilton Shaw was confident that Gracie was the best man to direct their baby project at the time, Rocket Man a biopic centered around Elton John. Said Shaw, Michael has an innovative, imaginative, and compelling vision for the film. This is how I imagine all executives talk. Sure. We want to create an experience that surprises and moves audiences, and knew immediately that he was the perfect director to take them on this journey. But he wasn't, because he continued working on the Barnum Project, while Rocket Man would later be released in 2019, directed by Dexter Fletcher. And he did a great job. Well, Gracie didn't. Well, he, was Fletcher did. he was the perfect man, Parker. No, Fletcher did a really good job with that movie. A few days after I being... I will fight you. I think I'm getting in too deep here. I didn't know what I was doing when I exposed Parker to the greatest showman. We'll see We'll see if the podcast survives this episode. We'll see if our oh, no. friendship survives this episode. <laughs> a few days after being told of Gracie's immense talents, Pasek and Paul were in a room with Michael who pitched the film to them as the timeless tale of P.T. Barnum, a man ahead of his time, a real Steve Jobs and or Jay-Z of his day, real quote. He referred to him as the original impresario, who was able to bring color and life and magic to an otherwise gray world, really open people's eyes, create some mischief and some wonder. But what really drew Pasek and Paul to the project was the fact that even though it was a period piece, the music would be contemporary. Said Gracie, the choreography's going to be contemporary. The music wants to be contemporary. So, Pasek and Paul wrote a couple songs during their week in L.A., and after Michael heard them, the collaboration began. Pasek and Paul wouldn't be formally announced as the film's lyricists until 2016. Hmm. While collaborating, Gracie would give Pasek and Paul contemporary references that included both Elton John, the subject of that film Gracie was the perfect man to direct, and Beyonce, country music star and wife to Jay-Z, a real modern Barnum... Bar damn it. No. A real modern <laughs> Barnum type. God. I'm taking that again, Parker. <laughs> I hope no. you know this is staying in. No, no, no. Take, We're take it no, again. We don't, we, no, we don't do it again. We're moving forward. In 2015, Jackman and Gracie... So we're in 2015 now. 
Jackman and Gracie were preparing for maybe the biggest moment of their lives. The day they were to do an elaborate read-through of the film and Passing and Paul's songs for some 20th Century Fox producers. The only catch was, Jackman had had a basal cell carcinoma removed from his nose the day prior and was ordered by his doctor not to sing. But he sang anyway and everyone cried. You can see the video online. And The Greatest Showman was finally greenlit. It was truly the moment we'd been waiting for. I figure I'll pause for uh, commercial breaks. Oh, sure. Yeah, this is our sponsored episode. Right. This the is the films... one we're going to get. Mm -hmm. The film's principal photography began on November 22nd, 2016, after seven years of production and 10 weeks of preparation for star Hugh Jackman. Jackman himself had been pretty unsure whether the film would ever even happen. All he knew was that he found the story of old Phineas the Barnum pretty goddamn inspiring. Said Jackman in a 2017 interview with Brett Lang for Variety, he really, for me, epitomized the idea that your imagination is your limit in a time where things were very rigid and when the social position you were born into was the one you were stuck in. And doesn't he just put it so beautifully? You can really understand how Barnum was a real Steve Jobs and or Jay-Z of his time. The Greatest Showman would initially do a big old fish flop into film houses on December 8th, 2017, but director Michael Gracie was not discouraged. Said Gracie, I was always very confident that it was all about word of mouth. I kind of feel like, when a musical, there's so few original musicals that people just don't know what to expect. Even from the trailer, there's always the seeing historically with musical trailers. Do we show people scenes? Do we not show people scenes? We don't want to distance the people who don't like musicals. It's such a bizarre thing because the argument can be the people who like musicals are going anyway. So really you should be targeting the people who don't like musicals and try to convince them this is actually worthwhile for them to see. Then The Greatest Showman spent 219 days in theaters, finally closing on July 26, 2018, having grossed a worldwide total of $435 million against a production budget of $84 million, making it the third highest grossing musical ever, both in North America and globally. Or at least, that's what The Greatest Showman's Wikipedia page would have you believe. Oh. That's what I was waiting for. I was waiting for a reaction. Oh. Mm. Everyone else would be eating this up, Parker. I can't believe you're you're doing this to me. You just Max <laughs> No, wait, no. You you did this to me. No, wait, hang on. Is where we are. Yeah, I did Hold forget. Hold on a minute. I did yeah. forget. Yeah, Taking you did. a look at I'm trying to finish the story. <laughs> <laughs> Taking a look at a different Wikipedia page, list of highest grossing musical films, tells a much different story. With Frozen at number three and The Greatest Showman 20 places below it at number 23. Two oh. spots below Alvin and the Chipmunks the Squeakle, and one spot below Les Miserables. Worse yet, Jenny Bix's only other musical film, Rio 2, stands triumphant at number 16. Hmm. They never cracked Rio 2. So maybe The Greatest Showman didn't do the greatest of all time. But at the end of the day, it still did better than anybody ever expected it to. And there's zero doubt that Zendaya and Zac Efron were in it. So let's hear what else Gracie has to say about his proudest work. You know, I love that project so much, and I had such an incredible time working with Elton and Lee Hall on that script for six years. Again, I'm not sure what's the latest on that. There was a period of time where I was on Showman, and there was a lot of pressure to move forward on the project. So unfortunately, I'm not sure what the latest is, but I will stay involved because I'm so fond of that story and of Elton, and the incredible life that he lived. I think Lee Hall's writing on it is just some of the most beautiful and poetic writing, so again, I'm not sure whether that's something I'm going to do next, but it's something that I would love to. It's an incredible film. Oh, I'm so sorry. That was that was Gracie's quote on the status of Rocket Man, circa 2017, talking about whether he was moving forward with it or not. <laughs> I'm sure he's fine. I'm sure he's fine with the fact that I'm he's sure the perfect... I'm, I'm sure, sure he's, he's fine, fine with the fact that he was the perfect man for the job and hasn't directed a feature since The Greatest Showman. But here's what Gracie really... <laughs> really said about his goals with The Greatest Showman. We used a lot of miniatures and backdrop paintings on the film to give it that kind of gritty Mary Poppins feel. But that being said, the cutting style and the camera work and the sequencing, it's very pop. And that's the whole film, I think, is this mix between musical theater in a more traditional theatrical sense and more contemporary pop. <laughs> yes, Parker, it looked like you had a, a thought. Gritty Mary Poppins. I think he means, like, something feels real. Gritty 
Mary Poppins. The kind of like, like I think like the the more typical. Yeah, no, I I, I got I got that. Man, what if they made a gritty Mary Poppins? <laughs> Parker, so far, would you say that The Greatest Showman is like a combination between musical theater and and contemporary pop? Would you say that that's it? it I'm I'm getting a sense that that really what he was going for was like a combination of like musical theater and contemporary pop. Mm-hmm. But that's just a theory. That's just a theory. Benj Pasek, in a 2017 video interview with CBC News, says it's a film that's a celebration of optimism and hope. It's not cynical at all. It really is a film that asks you to believe in possibility again. And, you know, I think some folks may find that corny, but I think we're living in a really sort of challenging and divisive dark time. We're reintroducing the idea of believing that the world can be what you want it to be and not having to accept it for what it is. It's something that I think is really universally appealing. And I, for one, completely agree. 2017 really was the year that America embraced the idea that the world could be whatever you want it to be and you don't have to accept the truth at all. In that same interview, Justin Paul said the goal was to make something joy-filled that could entertain families and really appeal to a family, more specifically a broad audience, (laughs) through the joy of music, the joy of dreaming, the joy of inventing, the joy of inspiring, and the joy of using one's imagination. Are your fingers going to break off from all those air quotes? Said Jackman, we like to say that we made the movie that Barnum would have liked to make. (laughs) So, Parker, what did... What did you think of The Greatest Showman? You know. <laughs> All right. Okay. First things first. Yeah. I, for one, yeah. have not spent years researching P.T. Barnum and developing a project around P.T. Barnum. No. Despite that... Even before this movie ever came out, I was aware that I was like, oh, P.T. Barnum's not a good guy. P.T. Barnum did not treat his employees very well or treat his animals very well. And that is the base knowledge that I knew about him. And so it is so funny hearing all these quotes from the production team talking about what a visionary he was and how he inspires imagination. It's like, I'm a layman Joe Schmo and I know he's an asshole. Like, what's your excuse? But Parker, he was the greatest showman. <laughs> okay, look, we're going to orbit around this point a lot as we I go we through are. And I like, know the exactly, summary. And I know exactly what the point is. I would like this movie a solid, like, 40% more if it was just about a dude. If you just <laughs> stripped out the Barnum of it all and just made Hugh Jackman a fictional circus guy. I yeah. would like this movie a lot more. Uh-huh. I just, it is the craziest thing in the world to me that they doubled down on making it P.T. Barnum, didn't stick to any historical significance about <laughs> him, play really fast and loose with historical figures, and then introduce Zac Efron as his partner and don't make him Bailey? <laughs> What's going on in this movie? What's happening? I... <laughs> Man, yeah, <laughs> that's yeah, Parker. That's yeah. that's so real. But because like, <laughs> and here I'll drop the facade a little bit <laughs> because <laughs> like, because they keep talking about how it's like, well, it's about making the world whatever you believe it to be. Mm-hmm. But I don't think that should apply to <laughs> history. <laughs> Like, if the theme of the movie is you can be whatever you want to be and you can make the world whatever you want it to be, fine. Sure. That's fine, because it's mostly a pleasant film about a lot of people who are shunned by society and they make their place in it and they have a wonderful time. Well, at the end. But to say that you're making a film that's like, no, but stop it with the cynicism, guys. Just, just... Just have fun. Just let go. Mm-hmm. You're the one who created the barrier from which we are having a hard time letting go. Yep. Because you could have just made a historical fantasy in which a magic man becomes a circus man. 
and he and there's no there's no real racism there's a lot of like you know like pouting mm-hmm. about black people and people with beards and people who are tall and small but like i don't know just like <laughs> Don't make it about P.T. Barnum. Like, it's 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 that easy. And it's so easy that they literally did it with Zac Efron's character. They yeah. literally went, oh, he's not Bailey. And it's like, well, then does the other guy have to be Barnum? <laughs> does he? Was Bailey? I don't well, like, know anything about Bailey. Was Bailey so terrible that they were like, we don't even want to put him in? But it's like, right. Barnum's not great. <laughs> so. See, I just like, I maybe, maybe a studio executive would disagree with me, right? Because the idea is like all publicity is a good publicity, even if it's bad publicity is kind of this idea. And I remember that there were a lot of people talking about this movie before it ever came out being like, why the hell is this about Barnum? Like Barnum's Mm. a piece of shit. We don't like Barnum. This film came out seven months after Ringling Bros and Barnum and Bailey had closed. Yeah. Like, and rather famously, received a lot of like friction in their business towards the end because of the animal thing. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, I don't know. So it's just know. like, I, 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 maybe they could make that argument of like, Oh, well the bad press drummed up, like, you know, p- people heard the name and things like that. But I just, I don't know. I am not a believer that any amount of that box office gross was because it was about Barnum. I don't think well, people went right. to see this. Cause like, Cause I want to like, see the PT Barnum. Would movie. people, would people be like, Oh, the name recognition, but it's like, right. Hugh Jackman's your name recognition. Exactly. People like Hugh Jackman. They'll see Hugh Jackman and they'll see mm-hmm. a movie. They released this at the holidays because they were like, oh, it's a feel good movie. Right. Just why even complicate it at all? Exactly. But it's a, such a weird production and we'll do the summary at some point. <laughs> it's such a weird production that it was like an offhand comment by producers of the Oscars during rehearsals of he reminds me of P.T. Barnum. Which is a connection I would never make, mm-hmm. but maybe that's just like me as like a Gen Z person. Maybe people, you know, maybe like boomers were just really in like, really like ingratiated with like maybe. Barnum's the greatest showman. Barnum's the greatest showman. But like, I don't know. It just feels so weird that like they made one comment and then Hugh Jackman went, "I'd like to do that. I'd like to be yeah. a, do a Barnum project." And then they went, "I guess we're writing this." You know, you know what a, a interesting alternate timeline imagining in my head is is yeah. that somebody just told him, "Oh, you're you're such a great showman, like very Harold Hill of you," and then he does Music Man on Broadway like four years earlier, and then ports it over to film. Yeah, and he's like, "Yeah, it, yep. it's the same energy." Well, he could have treating, just done the Music they're Man. They're treating Barnum like he's Jim Henson. They're treating yeah. him like he's Walt Disney, like he was this immense creative who, mm-hmm. but we ran into this when we were watching the movie, we kept bumping up against, what does he do? What do you do? They keep, they, at one point someone says, they're not here for the acts, they're here for you yeah, and your crazy ideas. And it, At which like, point, yeah, I'm pretty sure ahead. I just like turned to you and started quoting the Seth Rogen, Steve Jobs bit, like, what do you do? Oh my God, I would love to see the Steve Jobs sequel to this in which Zac Efron's <laughs> right. character, because he's not Bailey, like is built in, has to leave so that mm-hmm. Bailey can come in. And if they made a sequel to this <laughs> where Zac Efron just has that scene from, you know, with Steve Rogue. <laughs> like, and I am tired of you telling people I was Zac Efron when I know I was Bailey. <laughs> I'd watch it. Oh, I'd watch the I'd, hell out of that. I'd, I'd watch the hell out of that. <laughs> oh, man. Anyway, just <laughs> wild to me that this movie is like yeah. so predicated on the idea of you buying that Barnum did anything other than exploit people. Yep. Okay, maybe he had the idea of putting them in a tent together, but like... Right, but like it just... Ugh. What? Like it's just... And I, again, I want to like... I think we should do the summary. We should. And we should like definitely judge this movie based on what it is. Yep. Which I can do. Oh, but trust also, me. But I also, can do. <laughs> but also completely also holding space for the fact that like 
this shouldn't have been a Barnum movie. This shouldn't have been a Barnum movie. And we're going to have to accept that it is, but like, man, this would be so much easier <laughs> if it wasn't. And what's crazy to me is that this isn't even Hamilton's fault. No. Like, it's not even like a, oh, people love historical figures being cool. It's mm. not that. This was in production from 2011, like 2009, like basically from like 2009. It was in production for like seven years before they even yeah. were greenlit. Which you jump scared me with that uh, Rocket Man quote because I was going to say, I was like, you mean to tell me they worked on this script for six years and this is what we got? Like, I imagine they were probably doing some script stuff that whole time, but like, God, like it just, it's... <laughs> Yeah, well, objectively like, I mean, not a good script. All we really know is that like the first draft was ready to be sent to Michael Gracie in like, you know, 2010, 2011. Yeah, like yeah. which means that they wrote it within like two th- between 2009 and 2010 and that was the first draft. And then there's like no other update on any other writing because it's only those two writers credits. Mhm. I don't know. Yeah. And at some point, Jenny Bix had to write Rio 2, which came out before this movie. So at some point, they were just like, I guess we'll just move on. We turned in the script for The Greatest Showman. Yeah. Must you have. know? Um, all right. Before we get into the summary, I'm going, I'm going to front load because uh, bits aside, and the bit will still continue to a certain extent. I, I don't have very many good things to say about this movie, so I'm going to start. I'm going to front load with the things I do actually like about yeah. this movie. Because yes. there are things. Like, I, you, we were talking about this. I gave it a two and a half, which is a 50%. I liked yep. 50% of this movie. Yeah. And the 50% that I liked, I, I'm always happy to see Hugh Jackman singing and dancing. That oh, is yeah. what he was made for. That is what he's born for. He does great in his other stuff. He's really good as Wolverine, and I get why that launched him to superstardom. But all the man wants to do is to be able to live a life of singing and dancing because he he's very do, good at it. He wants to do a funny little showman routine. He's a funny little showman routine, and he's great at it, and yeah. he's really good in this. And now I'm pissed we never got the the timeline where Hugh Jackman just made the music man into a movie after he did right. it on Broadway, you know? Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Um, so I, I really like Hugh Jackman in this. For the most part, I think the performances across the board are pretty solid. Um, yeah. I wouldn't say that they're necessarily like... Some of like the featured extras, like you know Zac Efron's dad... I think is like chewing the scenery for his like one I think scene. Everyone who has to be mean, yeah, to the to that's the that's a people, really good point. Everyone who has to be mean to the circus people feels like a cartoon guy. Yeah, he's like, yeah. hey, get out we of here. We don't us. like you. you. I don't know why they're suddenly like Peaky Blinders guys when this is very much set in New York, but they're yeah, like, but... hey, get out of get out of here. You know, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, exactly. So like, I would agree. Oh, hmm. oh. Um, I do, I do genuinely think that the direction is pretty solid. I I think there's good use of moving the camera around. I think some of the dance sequences are a little over edited, but for the most part, they do a good job of having like wide shots where you can kind of see the action and And the camera's dynamic enough. There's like some really solid, like intentional, like camera work with like movement and stuff that Mm -hmm. also, that isn't just like we're filming people dancing it's also like they're making use of like film techniques and like you know theatrical dancing totally technique. like um yeah 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 and you can see that like that makes sense that that's the director's background and area of expertise because the other half of the filmmaking is kind of dull like dialogue scenes are very static and kind of stilted but it makes up for it in the big spectacle spectacle moments yeah. um I like the music. I think the music deserves a better story. I think it deserves a better musical, yeah. honestly. Um, and but like it, it's all catchy. Like they're well, they're well written songs. Yeah, there was an interesting quote from Hasek and Paul when I was doing research that I didn't put in, but basically they were like, "We weren't trying to write something that was for the radio," which I thought was so interesting because my presumption was they definitely were, and right. also I don't necessarily believe them. <laughs> I also don't think they achieved that. <laughs> right. Because like it is radio friendly. 100%. Totally. Every single one of it, every single piece of it is like not at all. I mean, like I would argue that like the other side can't mm-hmm. be played on the radio because it's weirdly about two men making a business deal. <laughs> like, sure. But like most, for the most part, like never enough. This is me. You know, even the greatest show is like just kind of generally like 
what if you could go to a fun place and yeah. there was a lot of fun and we're rebels and we're running through the night and mm-hmm. lights and this is where you want to be and it's yeah. like whoa <laughs> that sounds fun yep. on the radio but yeah i don't know i don't know if i believe them but it sounds like their their intention was not to do that that's interesting but also doesn't surprise me because literally the only influence like the references that that michael gracie was making with it was like exclusively pop artists so like totally you know beyonce and elton john but also billy joel adele and ingrid michelson so they were Mm -hmm. aiming for like in the basically the goal was like songs that tell a story but are also just contemporary pop songs like that was the goal well i think uh, like another good litmus test for not even their intentions but just like where it landed is the fact that another big like money-making thrust of this movie was that Hugh Jackman took it on tour. He took it in concert around and he would sing these songs around the world. And it's like, Ryan Gosling didn't do that with La La Land. Like that's not, that music would, isn't designed would, to be that way. Would someone pay like $200 to just go see Ryan Gosling perform <laughs> City of Stars quietly on a stage? Right. I don't know. No. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. But like, that's the but, point is that like these songs and, can be completely removed from their context and just have Hugh Jackman singing them on yeah. stage with a group. They can, and it's like, they oh can yeah. Be, they can be a stadium hit. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Not every musical theater song can be a stadium hit. So. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. So all this to say, that's, that's the 50% of this movie I liked. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. All right. Do we want right. to get into the summary? Yeah, uh, how would you like to do the summary, Parker? You Just should make... do the summary. Oh, <laughs> is it because you were? Drunk? I can try, <laughs> Max. Oh, Max, I I remember the bits. I don't remember the order. <laughs> I thought you were gonna say I remember the bits. I don't remember the movie. <laughs> also true. <laughs> All right. No, well, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna zoom through this because uh, there was a lot of it. there was a lot of contention, not contention, but like discussion between Parker and I as to whether or not this April Fool's episode should be our shortest or our very longest. Uh, uh, yeah, we'll, I really we'll I thought about it. Yeah. yeah, somewhere in the middle, I think is good. But um, yeah. summary summary goes a little something like this: B. T. Barnum is the is leading. Well, he's leading the circus, mm-hmm. and he's singing a big old song, and then he suddenly is like, "Oh, but what?" What about when I was a kid? It does follow the biopic structure. Well, it's so interesting too in that because he's that was... performing, and then he has to think about his entire life before. Yeah, he... and like <laughs> that was the first thing that happens in the movie. And I jokingly turned to you and I was like, "Oh, I too also imagine my older self exactly the way I am." And you're like, "Oh, I've always read this as him looking back." But for me, because it cuts straight to him as a kid looking at himself in the reflection of like the circus man outfit. I fully assumed that like we were going chronologically that that opening was like his vision of the future. Mm. I think you're probably right. I think, I think mm-hmm. it, it, that does follow the biopic structure, but just yeah. interesting that we found two different interpretations of that. It's such a rich film open oh, to interpretation. So many, oh, so many, <laughs> so many readings, readings to be had. <laughs> yeah. So he's a kid and he's the son of a tailor and they're really poor. And he's just like, Oh, dad, oh. And they go to this rich guy's house so that his dad can do Taylor stuff. Mm. And he meets the Taylor's daughter and they're immediately like, oh, we're in love. And then the dad, like the rich father is like, mm, get away from my daughter. He kind of slaps him. Slaps hits him. him. He hits him real hard. And then uh, Hugh Jackman's out on, no. Well, he's out on the beach. Yeah, he's out on the beach right after that. He's out on the beach and she comes out and finds him. She's like, we'll be and friends. Then, and then he starts going, do my <laughs> and then uh they are separated because Hugh Jackman's dad dies and this is all during the song um uh cuz basically he's like I have a million dreams in my head. I have so mm-hmm. many dreams. I have <laughs> this baby can hold so many dreams. And uh and his dad dies and then they get separated cuz she gets taken off to like boarding school or whatever. Mm-hmm. And but they still ride each other and at one point Barnum is is trying to steal bread. It was a loaf of bread. Just a um, loaf of bread. It's a good thing he didn't steal any candlesticks later. Yeah. Um, but he stole a loaf of bread, <laughs> and he gets like it gets taken away from him, and he gets beat, and then he's and he's in an alleyway, and someone with a physical disability, like deformity, um, hands him an apple. Uh-huh. The kindness wow. of a 
of a stranger. P.T. will remember this, the film says. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just every time he looks at an apple, I guess, because later yeah. he's later he just sees an apple and he's like, <gasps> oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I remember. I remember kindness. kindness. Um, what if I exploited that? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, Million Dreams wraps up. They're old now. It's a really kind of jarring cut from the kid to Hugh Jackman. There's no middle actor no it's just like kid singing and then hugh jackman plays a 22 year old <laughs> yeah something it's like very vague but he's like he comes back to the house and he goes i'd like to marry your daughter and the rich man's like mm, mm, she'll be back mm, she'll tire of your mm, lifestyle mm. and she goes with him and it's michelle mm. williams now and they go off and they finish million dreams by dancing on a rooftop and in a train like station kind of vibe and like a big yeah. moon Big painted backdrop. You mentioned that you really liked the painted backdrops. In I did. This. I liked. I liked the backdrops in this. Yeah, and it sounds like they did some miniature work. I didn't see any of that. Um, I didn't spot it. But yeah, I didn't that's spot cool. it. But that's cool. Yeah, props to them for doing that, and also props. You know, Ba-dum-ps. like set, like set. Oh yeah, there we go. That's what we need. We need more of that. Um, just yeah. you need I'll doing put in that some after. Old... Yeah, we'll get some fully work. Yeah, can we get like a soundboard? Um. So anyway, that wraps up. They have kids mm. and Barnum's like works at like the accounting factory. <laughs> I guess. And he, he, he's, he's writing some sort of document and then he looks outside and he goes <gasps> and he runs over to his boss and he goes, hey. He goes, hey, you know those guys who fly around on gliders? And he's like, what? He's like, those guys who fly around on gliders? What if we, we surely there's a way we could we could use yeah. that. He gets here. cut could... off before his idea because his idea is nonsense. Because his idea sounds like he's like, well, gliders are really cool and creative. And what if we had a creative thing like that as yeah. part of this? And everyone in the room watching the movie went, what do you mean? What are you talking about? How are you going to bring? He's like, what if we do taxes while we're on a plane? Like, what do you mean? Yeah. Like... It's like, what, what do you, what? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's meant to it's be a... like whimsical shorthand, but it's nonsense. It's not. Man. Never thought I'd say it, but this movie wants to be Wonka so bad. Um, and the boss, his boss turns to him and goes, right, well, that would be great if we weren't, you know, dead as a business. And he goes, what? And he goes, yeah, we're we're shutting down. And he goes, but what about all our ships? You know, what about all our, our, our great ships that we have? And he goes, they're, at the, they're in the South China Sea, deep in the South China Sea. And everyone went, aw, because we all were so sad for this accounting factory. Uh-huh. Um, so then he goes home from the accounting factory. And well, he goes, he, s- he steals the manifests oh, yeah, for the true. ships. Oh yeah, you're, I forgot, Barker. He steals the <laughs> yeah. manifests for the ships, and then he goes to like the bank, and he's like, "Can I have a loan? Here's all of the ships. Here's my I collateral. Have. Here's my collateral. It's all these ships I have." And later, his wife is like, "And this is like the most they do with this that he's like kind of a conniving man." Yeah. Uh, short. I guess you could shorten that into a con man, but they really don't play with it too much, no. which is odd to me. You could even make it like likable if you're gonna do Barnum and try and make him like a whimsical, likable man. May, have him have an edge. Have him, and they yeah. do that. They do that a tiny bit, but not really. Like after these first like few scenes of him setting up the circus, like it's gone. Yeah, he is, and then he gets roped into nonsense. But he doesn't, <laughs> like his, do, and he, and he doesn't do anything for the rest of the movie. His Dark Knight of the Soul isn't even his fault, which is so weird because so many other things in this movie are his fault it, that he gets no comeuppance yeah, for. It feels like this is a character who should have some comeuppance, but he gets none. None. And his yeah, and his like lowest moment isn't even his fault. So yeah, whatever. Anyway, <laughs> whatever. Oh, this movie. So. He, he gets a loan from the bank or whatever. He opens a museum and it sucks because it's just like mm-hmm. wax figures and old drafts. And his daughter's like, Daddy, you need something that's alive. And he had just, he was reading her the Tom Thumb book. And also earlier in the day, he had seen a really small man. And then he looks from the book to the apple and is like, huh. and he goes to the home of this very small man who I can't remember the name of, but also... It's not even what the real story was. So why is why are they trying no. to make it the historical figure? Because the real story is so sad. Every mm-hmm. story of every character in this movie is so sad. And this yep. movie's like, but what if this is who they really were? But and what if they were so happy with Barnum? But what if they were 
what if Barnum liberated them and made them feel free to be them? Mm-hmm. What about that? And I go, what about yeah, that? I, I don't know. <laughs> what Why'd then? you do? Mm-hmm. Why'd you do this? <laughs> anyway, so he enlists everyone. There's like a there's like a montage of him getting a bunch of people, um, and mm-hmm. then he opens the circus. And he's going into debt to do it, but he's op- he opens the circus and they sing "Come Alive," um, and people come and see it, right? Mm-hmm. And then the circus is open. Yeah, that's basically it, right? Yep. And also, Great. just <laughs> fundamentally, there are some aspects of this production that are greatly missing the point of what they're trying to do. It's it's mm. up on that level of like singing in the rain, entire plot being about the wrongs of dubbing over somebody and then Debbie Reynolds singing is dubbed over with an actress who didn't get credit. Right. <laughs> to the point that we've got, we've got our actor playing the, the Tom thumb guy. His mm-hmm. name is Sam Humphreys. They dubbed over all of his lines. And also in certain shots, they have him on his knees cause they decided he wasn't short enough. And I'm just like, do you and understand I, the movie you're trying to make? I didn't know that. And then our friend pointed it out. And it's unbelievable I it's didn't know that. It's so because obvious once you know CGI it. The CGI legs and feet that they're doing for him are so bad. Yeah. It's wild. It's, it's, it's rough. It's wild that they would do that, right? It's, but like, yeah, they're literally, it's literally kind of, in some ways, it is the film that Barnum would make. <laughs> you know? Yeah, And I do want to be fair to that quote. I thought it was funny to end with it, but I do want to be fair. Jackman is saying that in response to the fact that this movie really like glosses over P.T. Barnum and portrays him as a wonderful man. Mm-hmm. And that's what Hugh Jackman's saying. He's saying, right. we made the film that he would have wanted us to make. But I'm like, right, but now you're lampshading it? Like, yeah, you're like, yeah we made a movie about a terrible man, but he, you know, he would have loved it. And I go, okay. <laughs> Your point? Yeah. 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 Anyway, anyway, so after this, like the circus is all together, Zendaya is there, the bearded mm. lady is there, there's a dog man. There's a lot of people that they introduce in this and then don't have a lot to do. Well, that was when you were talking about the wax museum. I was like, what about his like bookie employee guy that like he gets so much focus in the first half of this movie and then he disappears completely. Yeah. I'm like, okay. Well, he wasn't, he wasn't weird. Right, yeah. So, you know, I don't know, man. I, I don't know. So, I, I, I'm going to skip over a lot of stuff. Basically, yeah. at a certain point, he goes, there's a critic who's like, boo. And Jackman has the funniest line. Barnum has the funniest line, which Parker missed, which I was so mad about because I had such a funny bit planned for it when I heard ah, it. Ah, tragic. Um, but Jack Barnum goes, wow, a theater critic who can't find joy in the theater. And I'm like, yeah, man, that's what critics do. <laughs> what, what what are you talking about? What Like, that's <laughs> not like you think that you got him, but you yeah. didn't get him. Got but then him. when he said what that, I was like, when he said that, I was like, man, I wish Parker was here. So I could have gone, huh? A film critic who can't find joy in a film. And it's like, yeah, man, it's based on the circumstance. That's what, what critics tell do. <laughs> like, that's his job. That's literally his job. <laughs> <laughs> his job is critic <laughs> anyway but like they're like oh this big moment barnum was good totally got him yeah Did he? Did anyway he? barnum's in debt he's in serious debt and so he goes mm-hmm. to zach efron who's like a local really famous play producer yeah. um and zach efron it feels like he's doing his best chris evans in this role because when Ooh. barnum arrives he goes huh you know, it sounds like he's saying, well, that's an awful lot of conjecture. You know, like it sounds like mm-hmm. he's doing Chris Evans in Scott Pilgrim slash Knives Out. You know, like, yeah. and maybe that's just how he talks. I haven't seen I the Iron Claw, but I don't think it is. It feels like he's like, well, <laughs> yeah, he's know. kind of he's, he's putting it on. He's putting it on. He's like beefing it up a little bit. Yeah. Anyway, they go inside and they're making a deal because Barnum's like, I need you to give me some like some credit with the critics and also money. And they have a good song. I think it's a good number. I think it's one of the best, like, choreographed numbers in the it film. It is. And, and the star of the show is the bartender. He's great. Bartend- and it's the just so The bartender's fun. He feels like a, like a musical theater character. Okay. So, so a thing about this song that I wanted to talk about is that, yeah. like, a good rule of thumb with musical theater is that 
a well-written song and a well-placed song should be advancing the story. It should be moving things along, like, in context of that song. I'm not talking about, like, well, things were this way before the scene started and the music started, and then they're this way afterwards. Because the first number right. does that, and it doesn't do a good job. Because the lyrics have nothing to do with what's happening. It's just like, oh, they're kids, and now they're adults, and all these things changed, but we aren't hearing about that in the song. Right. This song, in like, like you were talking about, the one that you couldn't play on the radio because it's actually doing something like the <laughs> lyrics of the song are actually propelling the story forward and changing the status quo, which makes it a good musical theater song. Right. Because they're actually like saying things that influence the movie. It's again, like I said that about, I said this about this, this is me later. Mm. I was like, this song doesn't do much like, no. And then, you know, um, one of our friends was talking about it and was like, well, but it actually like it does like, you know, it, it, for the characters, and I'm like, right. Like the characters feel more proud of themselves, mm -hmm. but like nothing like literally changes in the story. Like right. Barnum is still locking them out. They're still, they just, it's just them kind of like hyping themselves up again, which is fine. Yeah. But like, sure. I don't know. It's just like, I don't know. So I really like the other side for that, for what you said, because mm -hmm. it literally progresses the story. And also, they don't edit as much. There's not as many like rapid cuts. Yeah. You know, you're like you're, you're allowed to like watch the scene just play out in, mm -hmm. in certain parts. I mean, there is still like cutting obviously, but like, sure. you know, anyway. Yeah, so yeah, I agree. Uh, Zach Efron comes on board uh, and he <laughs> sees Zendaya and he goes, oh. 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 he's in love. He's so in love. That's the love sound. And that's the love sound. Oh. That's how you feel when you're in love. Um, and so, yeah, that, right? Mm -hmm. And then, man, this movie's hard to track. Maybe it's it because... Basically, the second half is... I remember the songs the most, and they don't yeah. do a lot. Yeah, like, basically, the second half as I remember it, and you can correct me as oh. I go, is, like, he he starts, like, Barnum starts trying to... Like, the, the circus is a success, and is doing really well. And he starts trying to flex that into getting into like upper echelons of society. So he's going to these right. fancy parties and these operas and he's rubbing elbows with these people and he's throwing these parties. And specifically like that's there to show that he meets Rebecca Ferguson's character. Right. Well, they also real quick in between that, they do meet the queen. I think that's, oh, that's right. Thank I you. think that's yeah. the next thing that happens is mm -hmm. that they get invited to meet the queen. And yeah. They Zach get Efron invited. Pulls some strings. Zach Efron's like, I pulled some strings. We're meeting. Pulled some strings. We're meeting the queen. We're meeting the queen. We're meeting the queen. And then Zendaya is like, "Can I be there?" And it's like the film, like doing the lead, like <laughs> the bare minimum with yeah. racism of just like, "Can I be there?" It's like, yeah, I... yeah, I don't know, <laughs> like because also this is set during the Civil War. Mm -hmm. It's just like I don't know, but they're but it's it's removed from that. It's escapism, right? Sure. But it's so weird because the movie wants to be so escapist and like obviously you need something to escape from. But it really is just like like earlier we said that like every like bad guy in this movie is kind of cartoonish. But that's probably a, like a stylistic choice to allow the film to do what it needs to do because they yeah, there can't fair. be real danger from these guys. No. Right. They just need to be like, eh, like they need to just be like a heckler. Mm -hmm. But it just I don't know. It like feels weird to me how like little and casual the, totally. that they do with it when it's like, this would be, I don't know. And it's fine. Again, I don't want to sound like a jerk because obviously this is a fun musical. That's my job. Yeah. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm supposed the jerk. To, oh man. I totally forgot that I'm supposed to just be like, woohoo. Yeah. On this episode. All sunshines and roses. Man, I forgot the premise of the episode. I'm sorry, everybody. You are the Barnum to my theater critic. Crit a film critic who doesn't love film. <laughs> he didn't like your film. Leave him alone. Relax. <laughs> it's so funny. Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah, so, they so go, then they're yeah, so they're rubbing elbows with all the rich people. Mm -hmm. Barnum is introduced to Jenny Lind, the mm -hmm. Swedish Nightingale, who in this movie is an alto, which is yep. interesting because she was a great operatic soprano. Yeah. Um, but no one wants to hear that, obviously. So, no. I mean. Props to this movie for giving more, like, mainstream, like, 
you know, musical songs to altos. Sure. They deserve that. It is just so funny to me that the filmmakers are like, hmm, let's take a real life historical figure and let's just make her a home wrecker. She wasn't in real life, but let's make her one. Let's for the just movie. make her one. Why not? <laughs> That's what women do in history, <laughs> That's right? That's what women do. That's what women do. <sighs> anyway, so yeah, he meets Jenny Lind and he goes, oh, you're a great, re- a real talent. Uh, I'm going to produce your tour. Basically. What do you do, Barnum? He, this is the weirdest. Show us this what is the, you do. This is the weirdest, loosest part of the film because the entire second half is Barnum leaves the circus in Zac Efron's hands and goes off to do a tour with Jenny Lind. But he's not doing anything, obviously. No. He's like the guy who arranged the tour but also is damaging the tour because on her first performance, he goes out on stage and they go, Barnum, what is this? Give me some peanuts, you know? And then she sings and they all go, oh, wow, wow, wow. And, Ooh, and then, but he, but he, and also he hadn't heard her sing before that. He like brought Insane. her in front of, he brought her in front of it's everyone. So he, he brings Jenny Lind in front of everyone that he wants to impress, including Zac Efron's parents who disapprove of Zac Efron and Zendaya holding hands, by the way. Right. right. Um, a lot of things happen that move the plot forward during Jenny Lind's song, Never Enough. Mm-hmm. That has nothing to do with it's just like a lot of people looking at other people and it like changes the entire dynamic of the movie. And I yeah. can't tell if I love it or hate it. Oh, I hate it. Oh, okay. I firmly <laughs> hate it again, because you could just integrate some of those things into a song. But it just like, like you said, everything about the status quo of all of these character dynamics fundamentally shift by the end of this song that could play in a coffee house, you know? And also none of them are involved in the song. They're all just listening to the song and she's singing the song. Yeah. And they're just looking at each other from across like vast distances at this opera house. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, Oh, and now everything's changed. Whoa. But like Barnum like has a moment backstage where he's like watching her sing and he's like, Oh my God. He's like coming to tears. And his wife can see him. Right. Did you in catch that? Like somehow she sees him in the wings somehow. <laughs> and, yeah. Like, a... Sees his reaction and she kind of gives like a, uh oh, I know where this is going. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And so Jenny Lynn sings this this song and now she's you know now they're gonna be in business together, and he's just gonna produce a tour basically. I guess. He's just gonna take her around and be like, here she is, and it's like you're not doing anything. She was already doing that. You just kind of like discovered her talent, but even then you didn't because she had a name. Like she had she, like a performance name. People, people knew, her. knew she, who she, she was. Would have come, and I like. I understand that, like obviously, like he's like I brought her to America. Like I arranged her first American tour. Sure, but the movie acts like he did something. <laughs> you know. Yeah, and she's like really attracted to him, and I'm like right because he's Hugh Jackman, but he's not doing anything for mm-hmm. you. Yeah. He's just taking you around. So anyway, all of this is happening. The circus people during the, okay. So during never enough, you know, they, after never, sorry, after never enough, all of the circus people come up because they were in the standing room at the back and they all come forward and they're like, Oh, she has such a beautiful voice. And Barnum's like, get out of here. Go back for me. Don't come in here. You're ruining it for me. You're ugly. You're ruining it for me. He closes the door on him. And that mean act is never addressed. It's not because they just learn to love themselves instead. Yeah, they're just like, oh, okay. And then literally, like, that's what blew my mind is fast forwarding ever so slightly. And then we'll come back to this. Of like, yeah. The next time they talk, the next time they see Barnum on screen is, I think, the fire. And then immediately after that is to come and cheer him up about everything bad that happened. Well, yeah. Yes. And we'll get to that. Yeah. But here the, he shuts the door on him. And they're sad. And then they sing, this is me. Mm-hmm. And they and it shows them continuing to do the circus to much acclaim from people who come to see it. What this movie also does is act as if, because obviously in the movie, because it is a fantasy sequence, and I want to give credit to that, that this is fantasy. Like the music, right. the music, like the songs in this, except for Jenny Lynn's, are kind of like obviously supposed to be fantastical. And in this movie's version of events, the circus people are doing this great dancing in a very well-produced cinematic tent. Mm -hmm. But again, 
like I don't know. It just feels weird that they're like, oh, these acts inspired wonder in yeah. the audience, which is like okay, but I feel like the circus pretty regularly was just kind of like, come laugh at these people. Yeah, and like the, tra- the trapeze artists, absolutely. Like that's all sure. inspired. Like that's amazing. But the movie like throws them all in together. It's like here's a trapeze artist. Here's a big man. Here's yeah. a dog man. And it's just I don't know. Like it's such an odd right. <laughs> like well, especially because like historically, circuses like Barnum's would have you know these oddities as they would call them, and basically. Each of them would have a tent. You would yeah. go in and you would look at the bearded lady and the bearded lady would talk and do a little bit of a skit or whatever. And then you'd be like, oh, okay. And yeah. then you go to the next tent. You see the next person like that was their act. They weren't was, all doing that group was numbers. The, that was the oddities and unique persons act. Mm-hmm. And then you'd go to the big tent and it would be trapeze artists, right. clowns, people on elephants, elephants and giraffes and stuff, right? And so it's just interesting that, I mean, again, it makes sense for the film that they're making, but really it seems like they could have made a fantasy film about a guy who invented Cirque du Soleil like a hundred years earlier. Mm-hmm. And again, it just had no complications. Like it just feels right. weird that they set themselves up for such a weird, complicated story. Like you well, could have just, just like... made a fun movie, but you made a fun movie that's based in like the like exploitation and suffering of real people. Right. And like, granted this movie came out after greatest showman. So it's not relevant to like how the movie was developed, but I just kept thinking about Guillermo del Toro's nightmare alley. And it's like, that's what these sideshows were actually like. They're very like, yeah, there's camaraderie there, but everybody knows that they're being exploited and kind of just deals with that. And they don't address that. Like there is never a point where any of these people sit down and are like, Hey, do you think that PT is maybe like using us? Like, do you think that what we feel pride about and we're singing about of like, this is me and I feel love for myself isn't how our employer views us. And maybe that's a problem. Like they never get that deep with it. But, But also the film just changes Barnum's motivation. Right. We're at the start, but also it doesn't really because at the start of the film, he's just like looking for weird people, like oddities, as he calls yeah. them, unique persons. Mm-hmm. And he's just like, oh, and they play with it again because he goes, how big are you? And, you know, the the world's largest man is like 500 pounds. And he goes, 750? And he goes, 750 yeah. pounds. But they play it like he's like, they're all in on it too. Right. right? It's so, it's such a weird like dissonance of like, I don't know, because they treat it like he assembled the Muppets. This is a Muppet movie. Mm -hmm. This is the 1979 Muppet movie, but based on a real guy, (laughs) you know, like it's an exploitative asshole. Oh man. Now that's a take on the Muppets. Wow. There you go. Gritty Muppets (laughs) where all the Muppets go, Kermit, you you're exploiting us. And he goes, no, I'm not. No, it's not true. <laughs> Max, Max, that's the Muppets in Reno. Oh, whoa, you're right. <laughs> Muppets already did gritty Muppets. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, let's finish this movie. Oh, my God. Let's finish so, this movie. Anyway. <laughs> Zach Efron and Zendaya have their big song. They rewrite the yeah. stars, or rather they don't. What did you think of Rewrite the Stars, having seen all of the action of the song? I don't know. <laughs> it was fine. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. I just, like... Again, I get it. I get that it's, like, a, a fantastical, elevated version of the material. I understand that. But, like you were just talking about, of like, the one circus act here that inspires awe is like trapezing and it would have just been in the same way that it's so exhilarating to see Hugh Jackman and Zac Efron actually doing those dance moves in the bar. I don't know. It'd be kind of cool to see some actual trapeze instead of what is so clearly grease green screen and CG for the entire sequence. Mm. Would have been cool to see some of that, you know? Yeah, that's true. But yeah, what do you think of that song? But alas, Oh, I think it's fine. (laughs) Okay. I think it's like fine. It's like a, it's like a fine love song, you know. Sure. 
it's interesting that it ends and it doesn't end with them being together. You know, mm-hmm. that's that's a fun twist. Subverts expectations. Yeah. Ooh. Um, and then some guys burn the tent down. There's like a big fight and they burn the tent down and that's when Barnum's coming back. But before that, sorry, the Jenny Lynn story ends. Mm-hmm. Um, because Barnum, oh my God. And also tra- tightrope happens in here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because but when does that happen? Because that doesn't happen after she knows about the photo. Somewhere in there, Michelle Williams, Charity Barnum, has mm-hmm. a song where she sings about how, you know, she thought that she'd be with Barnum through all of this, but he's just like running yeah. off to do things. She sings it when he first leaves on the tour. I think so. Because think she so. knows what's going to happen. But also what she knows is going to happen doesn't actually happen. And, no. then it, and then it's perceived that it did happen, but it didn't, which is such a non-conflict. <laughs> Of not like the non conflict, but like such a weird choice. So she sings the song where she's like, Oh, and you're walking the tightrope. Ooh, oh, yeah. you're gonna fall. What happens if I fall? Will you catch me? What happens if you fall? Will I catch you? Should I catch you? You know, she's uh-huh. like, I thought we were in this together. And then, you know, rewrite the stars happens, whatever, and then all that happens. And then the tent and then it's the it's the building. They haven't done the tent yet, because that's right, a big sorry. idea. The building. Right. I'm mm-hmm. so sorry. But also oh, it's Barnum's okay. with Lind. And at one point backstage she's like well you've been doing such wonderful work and we all went what does he do yeah um but he's like ah yeah this has been great and then she's kind of like are we gonna like have sex now basically this is like mm-hmm. her thing and he's like oh no no i can't do this no i would never do that i would never cheat on my wife and then she goes well then your show's over <laughs> and she <laughs> and she leaves and he's like oh you know and then yeah. on the last night of the tour that she's ended, he goes out on stage with her because she like beckons him on stage. Mm-hmm. And then she kisses him. She pulls him yeah. into a kiss that he didn't consent to. And someone snaps a pick right as that happens. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's like, oh. And Hugh Jackman does a really good job of acting. What was it? What? Oh, no. What happened? What, what, what was that? What was that? Which is so funny to me, and I get I, granted. I understand it's it's a different a different time and a different set of like societal rules. But as I understand it, throughout most of history, performers and theater people are very touchy feely with each other, and have been for a long time. And so it could have been so easy for him to play it off of like, oh, she's she's an actress. This is just what they do. It could have been so easy for him to just say she tricked me. Right, to go home, dude, like, immediately, like, that's what's so crazy is when he gets home, the first thing out of his mouth isn't, hey, you might have seen something about this because a lot of people took pictures. I just want to tell you up front, like, right now, it was, like, completely surprised to me, non-consensual, yeah. that was not my idea. Yeah, he doesn't write his wife, he doesn't tell her that. No, when he doesn't he say home, a word to her. When he gets home, he yeah, she's like, I'm leaving you. Yeah, right? she's got the newspaper. And he's shocked. He's like, why? Like, what's going on? And she's like, yeah. this. And he's like, oh, you found out about that. Oh, right. And it's like, oh, no. You, but once again, Barnum, you didn't do anything. You didn't do anything. It you, only, like, it, you've it makes hardly me done wonder anything. <laughs> if that, like, it makes me wonder if there was an alternate version of that scene shot where he instigated it. Because, like, Hugh Jackman's reaction in that scene feels like an earlier draft cut of, like, he kissed her and had an affair. Like, his reaction feels that way. And I wonder if test audiences rubbed up against him, like, we have to make him nicer. But they didn't have time to reshoot that scene, so his reaction is still as if he did that. Right, and I would guess that, but the way that the entire production crew talks about Barnum, I feel like they didn't do that. <laughs> probably. You're probably It feels right. like from day one they went, we're writing a cute I'm giving them movie. too much credit. We're writing a, a cute little movie for, for Hugh Jackman to play a man. Yep. And they just wanted him to be nice because Hugh Jackman yeah. is nice. He's a nice guy. Um, it seems. I mean, if you know, I I don't know everything about Hugh. Jackman. Purportedly, he's the nicest man in show business. Purportedly, yeah. <laughs> that makes it sound like I know something. Max. I mean, supposedly. Do you have exclusive? I, I don't have dirt on Hugh Jackman. <laughs> oh. I'm sorry. We could have hit the big time. No, it's fine. No, we'll hit the big time later. We okay. <laughs> hit the big time with our greatest showman episode. <laughs> Okay, let's just wrap it up. Let's wrap it up. The building burns down right Mm -hmm. as Barnum gets back. 
And yeah. Zach Efron runs in to try to save Zendaya, but he, she wasn't even in there. And then he gets really injured and goes to the hospital and she's really sad about it. Yep. Meanwhile, Barnum's like, I don't know what we're going to do. Mm-hmm. Team? Gang? I don't know what we're going to do. And they're there, and this is also where they find out they're like, oh, and the money. Oh, he doesn't have any money. He has no yeah. money because he put all his money in this building. No money. And like, it's just a real bad moment for Barnum, but not the moment that you would have ever thought that he should have. <laughs> no. Because the burning of the building isn't his fault. It's mm-hmm. not like he could have prevented it if he was there. Yeah. You know, it's not... Getting kissed wasn't his fault. <laughs> Everything bad in this movie wasn't his fault. He did no wrong. He can be he was, absolved. He was just a whimsical man who got up together a lot of talented people to do some mm-hmm. dancing that people loved. And that's what yep. he did. And so anyway, the building's burned down. He's like, I don't know what we're going to do, you know? He doesn't mm-hmm. know what he's going to do. And it's just a real low moment for everybody, you know? Yep. And then the scene with his wife happens? Yeah, because, because his we, wife and his kids are at the train station when he gets there. But the minute mm-hmm. that he gets there, he hears about the burning and he runs to the building. Yeah. So then he comes back home later and she's like leaving him. Mm-hmm. And that's when he goes to the bar to be sad. Yeah, because the bar to be sad. <laughs> because he's lost everything. Because he lost his building and he lost his wife. And his friends, who the last time they had an actual conversation with him was him saying, you can't come into my party. Well, but also they screen. do talk at the burning. like Right, but like they don't have much of a conversation. They're just like, oh, a burn, a building's burning down. Like, that's it. Yeah. I'm but talking he, about like a, a, he, a grounded, he, calm combo. Well, but he does seem remorseful at the burning of the building. Anyway, you're right. You're right. <laughs> Max, are you replacing Pedro Pascal in Fantastic Four for how far you're stretching right now? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Barker, you're on fire, not unlike Joseph Quinn in Fantastic Four. It's a Fantastic Four episode, everybody. Oh, man, I can't wait for that next year. <laughs> we just start having so modern All of his movies. friends, his so friends come, his friends to, come to the bar, and they're like, you know, you really kind of messed up, didn't you? And he goes, yes, I did. And they go, well, good news for you. We've all been there. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's the vibe. You it's gave like, us hey, a man. home. Hey, man, like you... You, you, look, you gave us a home. You brought us together to do something wonderful. The least we can do <laughs> is remind you who you are. Yeah. You know, this is me, but this is you. Uh-huh. And then he goes, from now on, you know, because he's yeah. like, oh, I'm going to be good now. Yeah. And you were right to say that it changes genres from a lot of the other songs. But from now on, kind of goes hard, in my opinion. It's, no, I, it's, again... I like it. Removed from context, it is a very well-written, catchy song. It's a catchy song. And the dancing's yeah. a little bit fun when someone, you know, they're on the floor and they're doing some fun stuff. It's just, like I said when we were watching it, it's just kind of a country music jump scare, suddenly. To be like, <laughs> banjo. So he they, they, they cheer him up with the big song, and he's like, from now on, like... My eyes will not be blinded by the light. I'm going to be grounded. I remember what all this was for. Yeah. And then he runs to the train station. Right? Mm-hmm. And he, yeah, but and then he runs to the house. He runs to the house. And he, and, he, and he... Oh, yeah. He runs to the house. Yep. And his, Oh, he, he, runs, yeah. he runs to her father's house. <laughs> yeah, he goes to her father's house where she's staying. And he's like, where's my wife? And, and he won't like, answer She's him. not here. And, and then, then his, his little girls. Yeah. And it's cute. It's kind of cute where she's like, she's mm-hmm. at the beach. And he goes to the beach. It's the same beach as when they were kids a wow. million dreams ago. And, um, and, <laughs> and yeah, and then they, they, they make up and they kiss. They kiss, whatever. they make up. Yeah. They, kiss, they go they back to up. the town and they he's bite, rummaging through the rubble of the building and the theater critic shows up. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. The theater critic yeah. shows up and he goes, you know what? It wasn't for me, but audiences really seemed to like it. <laughs> and that's basically what and he Hugh Jackman's says. like you're right and he's like and he goes well he goes and he goes another critic not me though another critic might have said you're the greatest showman and like that's not what he says but that's the gist of what he says it's the and gist it, it's wild to me that they didn't just do that full on yeah you know a, a better a better not a better critic than me but basically that's the vibe right is he's like if I wasn't such an asshole yeah. Maybe I would have really loved your this show. This is how I really feel. This is but how I, can't I really tell you feel. That, but I, I have, I have because, an, a, a reputation. I'm a, because I'm a, I'm a critic. 
Yeah. And I can't possibly be positive as a critic. <laughs> and so then, so then Hugh Jackman goes, we never needed a building. All we need is a tent down by the river, <laughs> you know, basically. Yeah. And Anthony Hopkins shows up as Odin and he says, the greatest show was never a place. It is a people. It's a people. Yeah, he doesn't he does say that. And then Ant-Man says, greatest showman, I'm going to need you to distract Kane. <laughs> so um, anyway, God, what is this episode, Parker? We've done too I, much. I'm, I'm, <laughs> my brain's bleeding out my ears. We started this at 730 in the morning. <laughs> Why? Oh, man. So anyway, that's the movie, right? That's it. That's, well, yeah. and then and then we get the greatest show reprise and Hugh Jackman's leading the circus. OK, but also. And then he retires. This is so funny. But this is so funny because Hugh Jackman and Zac Efron, they're like. Zach Efron's like, hey, you know what? Because he's better now. Zach Efron's like, I'm better now. Yeah. I got better. <laughs> and he I goes, got better. And he goes, we're 50-50 now. And Hugh Jackman goes, huh, really? Because that's what funds the tent, the tent mm-hmm. move, right? Yes. He goes, we don't need a building, we need a tent. And then the minute that he's there in the tent, Hugh Jackman retires. He's like, I'm af- done. After they've made the 50-50 deal, which mm-hmm. is so funny. It's so that funny. he's just like he's not retiring in that he he won't be receiving any money. It would right. Seem. He's just not going to do any work. <laughs> True to his character, he's going to do nothing, and he's yep. found a way to truly do nothing while still making fifty percent of the profit. <laughs> but he goes, Zac oh. Efron, you can do it now, and he gives Zac Efron the hat. And you thought that Zac Efron doesn't look as good in the in the circus. Well, I don't like the, I don't outfit. like the fact that he's all buttoned up. Because Hugh has the high collar and the cravat, and that yes. opens him up really well. Yeah. And, like, I don't know, Zach's feels more like a straight jacket. Like, it's very, like, closed off and tight. Yeah. And it's just, and it, pop a few of those buttons, man. Pop a few of those buttons. And Zach, everyone's like, I'm the greatest showman now. Yeah. And he and Zendaya are in love, and they hold hands or whatever. Sure. The end. The end. Oh, and Hugh Jackman. Also, there was a whole plot about Hugh Jackman's daughter and how Barnum's daughter wanted to be a ballet dancer. Yeah. So he goes is, and he watches her. Is that her. a plot? It's two scenes. Does that it's count like, as a plot? It's like three. <laughs> okay. And that's the greatest showman. Parker, it's time yeah. to do the hardest part of the episode, which is the criteria. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Historical and technical relevance. No. <laughs> Thumbs down. How... How does it make you feel? No. <laughs> Thumbs down. And now for the most interesting criteria point here. How well do you think it's doing what it's trying to do? Because everyone on the crew went, it's an optimistic movie free of cynicism that's an escape and a fantasy. And also Gracie's main goal was to make a movie that combined musical theater with contemporary pop. I think, and you you know these songs better than I do, so I would love yeah. to know your input on this. Yes. I think there is only one musical theater song in here, and I think the rest are pop songs. Yep, I agree. Like, that is my general opinion on that. <laughs> Okay, glad, glad, think, you, glad you agree. I also think that this movie, you know, it it's doing fine enough at being a fun, you know, lights and sound, just kind of let go movie. Sure. You know, like if you really just turn your brain off, it's fun. And I understand yeah. why it's stuck around for so long, because it's literally just like a fun movie to watch. Mm-hmm. But I think it still fails fundamentally because it rooted itself in something that is both historically known and complicated. And right. so you're going to run into a problem where half the audience can go, oh, what a beautiful story. Mm-hmm. And the other half of the audience goes, yeah, but why is it like this? Why what is this about, about Barnum? Yeah. Because Zac Efron isn't Bailey. So why is it about Barnum? Like, yeah, they, the the whole like project from the beginning is just kind of weird, 
and broken in that they're like, well, we got to make a movie about Barnum because we said that Hugh Jackman was like Barnum. And then he said, I want to do a Barnum movie. So we have to make it about Barnum. What's the movie about? Well, it's not really about Barnum because it's about the greatest showman. It's about this guy who does this stuff. But it has to be about Barnum because this whole thing started because we said he was like Barnum. Yeah. And he wants to do it. And like they all just believe that Barnum was this magical man who created whimsy and allowed people to wonder again in a gray world. But they never once mentioned the Civil War at the time. They never mm-hmm. mentioned anything. They're all so nonspecific of just like, well, it was at a time when things were very rigid. And he goes, yeah. And what did he do? He Which again. He exploited the lower class to get, you know, success. Yeah. He didn't like, inspire wonder. He inspired laughs and like some money. Yeah. That's all he did, really. And the fact that you're basing, and again, you can make this movie and you can say that it's this wonderful movie that's about the wonder of performance and artists and accepting people and loving people no matter what. But you are, you're, you're changing it. Right. (laughs) Again, like it's one of those things of like, it just, I don't know when you make it about a historical figure, you're taking on all of that baggage, like not just the Barnum stuff, but just the context of the time period, right? Like Mary Poppins is like turn of the century, 1800s, 1900s. And I never once am thinking about like, Hmm, does Mr. Banks have any opinion about the great war? Like, you know, it's one of the, I just, I don't think about it because that's not what the movie's about because there isn't that context for it. But when you plant so firmly, this is this person and he lived from this time period to this time period and you ignore all of the historical aspects of what was going on at that time in that country of that specific moment, you're just shooting yourself in the foot. You don't have to make it about anybody. Again, it's wild that this wasn't a Hamilton clone in a way. Mm-hmm. Because Hamilton was so successful for a lot of similar reasons, but has since seen kind of a retroactive, oh, well, I don't know if that's actually appropriate. Right. Right? Like, and again, call it cynical, but that's the reality of it. And it it honestly, Hamilton is so, and again, not to talk about Hamilton too much, but like both of these movies are so rooted in like, the optimism of the American dream in a way, Mm. right? Like they're both so like, isn't it beautiful how anyone can come from nothing and achieve something great. And both in order to tell that story have to completely ignore or like not reference the atrocities that those two men actually did. Right. Right. Because Hamilton was a slave owner. Everyone in that, musical you know Mm. like they were these men they were real and it's like fine and i think that hamilton does a better job of succeeding at that because it isn't afraid to portray hamilton as flawed fundamentally because he has the reynolds pamphlet which people go that's fucked dude why would you do that right Mm -hmm. but this movie goes does even like less and just goes well actually barnum didn't do anything wrong ever and it's like if you just portrayed this like if you want to do this if you want to do history in a way that is a little you know gloss glossy right yeah as a musical you can do that i don't know man i'm tired (laughs) i'm tired yeah i i I, I get every yeah we're orbiting around the same points of like I get what they were trying to go for, and I don't think they entirely succeed. Like, as far as how well it's doing what it's trying to do, it it has a lot going for it, but, like, the fundamental flaws at the center of this entire conceit make it impossible for it to be completely lighthearted and optimistic and removed from that because they made it about an asshole. (laughs) Comparing it to Citizen Kane, because both are about men Mm -hmm. who are, you know, poor young children who rise to the top of their field. (laughs) 
and and I, you know, I I talked about it in like that funny little intro paragraph that I had you read, but like rubbing shoulders with European leaders, mm-hmm. having an affair that leads to the downfall of their, you know, of their star, their rising star. You know, they're on the rise and then they fall. But one, Barnum never had an affair. But which I also forgot. I just fully thought that he had an affair. <laughs> yeah, wasn't real. But like Citizen Kane, I can't believe. It's the Citizen Kane. I know that's the movie. I know that's the show. But like Citizen Kane is a perfect example of having something to say about a historical figure. And even they were like, well, let's not use the real guy. Let's (laughs) create a fictional guy to achieve our purposes. Right? Yeah. And let him be an asshole. (laughs) Right. Well, and see, that movie's goal is to show that, you know, Hearst is an asshole. Right. This movie's goal is not to show that Barnum's an asshole. This movie's mm-hmm. goal is to be propaganda for Barnum, a circus that had closed seven months prior. So yeah. they're doing different things. Their goal is not to make their their goal is to make you feel sympathy and wonder at what Barnum achieved. Sure. I don't know, man. It just doesn't work. Yeah, I would. I would it also. W- it works if you completely ignore everything about the real guy at which point it begs the question why is it about the real guy well it's interesting because like it's the The, inverse of the issue we run into right where we we talk about like well we have to talk about the movie it is not the movie we'd want it to be this is the inverse of that we have to talk about the movie it is not the movie they wanted it to be (laughs) you know yep and again i just feel like yeah barger you're right this move this episode should have been 10 minutes because (laughs) Should but like the joke, minutes. the joke is that I had to do my whole report. But like, and it was a funny joke. But let's be real. This movie is broken because it's in, it's about Barnum. Yeah. If it wasn't about him, they just they just needlessly complicated everything. So I agree. And so to everyone out there who loves this movie, I know that friend of the show Jose Valle Jr. is is kind of in the corner of well, and maybe this, this is an argument that we had in 2017. You know, <laughs> like this is not. He probably has changed his mind. Maybe, maybe we sure. should ask him. Uh, call but, in Jose. You know, call in Jose. But you know, he at the time he was like, right, but just like if you just don't think about that, and it's like right, and I say that too, but like the movie is actively asking you to think about it, right. Because they made it Barnum on purpose. You have what's to the, think about that. What's the purpose of taking a real historical figure and making them unrecognizable in how wonderful they are other than to just do him a service? I guess. I don't. I don't. And in Name that recognition. Way, and in that way, I guess they really did make the movie that Barnum would have made. But why do you want to make the movie that he would have wanted to make? I don't Why know. did anyone make know. this movie? Why was it based on an offhand comment and then also just a result of a Lipton iced tea commercial happening? It's wild to me. Yeah, once you were mentioning all the Lipton iced tea stuff, I was just like, what? Why is this movie just an Oscars rehearsal joke and Lipton iced tea commercial? Yeah. That be- that that became a real boy. <laughs> Okay, so anyway, uh, by point metric, we're going zero for three. Citizen Kane is better than the better greatest showman. Than the greatest showman, and taking a step back can firmly shout from the rooftops. Citizen the greatest Kane showman is, is the greatest showman is not better than Citizen Kane. No, it is here's, not. Here's here's my question to you, Parker. Mm-hmm. Is it better than Forrest Gump? No, I don't think so. I also have thought about it a lot, and I don't think so. And I know that's not the show, but this is important because show. we now have a new, a new lowest, a new lowest movie on our <laughs> list. And I imagine it will stay there for a very long time. <laughs> Just, yeah, I guess. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Until well, the next April Fool's episode, when yeah. Max forces me to watch another bad movie. Yeah, I'm gonna make you watch Space Jam Two: A New Legacy. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was considered. <laughs> Thanks everybody for listening. I <laughs> hope had a good that, time. I folks. hope that you had a good time with this hour and thirty minute episode. Incredible. That sh- that could have been ten minutes. This could have been, been ten. E- minutes. This could have been an email. Could have um, been an email. 
Parker, do you know what we're doing next week? Next week, we are doing Daisies. Daisies. 1966, I believe. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. Very swing in the other direction. We're doing weird, surrealist, experimental filmmaking. Yeah, from Russia. From Russia. Just a 60s Russian experimental film. So yeah. get excited, everybody. <laughs> Look forward to that. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye.